Hi, I'm Joe. Uh, I'm here with Tomek, one of our core devs at Parity. Um, so today we're going to talk about off-chain workers and how you can use them in your runtime. So first off, what is an off-chain worker? Hi, Joe. I'm, I'm pleased to be here. And uh, yeah, an off-chain worker is a, is a, piece, of, a piece of logic that, can, that is being run after every, uh, every block. So let me just quickly jump to a code. So inside the service, which is the thing that is running inside the inside the client, inside the node, um, after every block is imported, uh, we trigger something that is called off-chain on block imported. That piece of logic will actually call into the runtime and will invoke the off-chain workers logic that is contained within the runtime. Uh, what is worth not uh, noting is that this um, this is running separately from the from the block import. So whatever the off-chain worker is doing, it's not affecting the import time of a block. So and it's not part of the consensus. So like part of the import time would be executing all of the extrinsics within that block. Exactly. Yeah. And so yeah. So like a block is going to have like a list of extrinsics and like, you know, this common blockchain thing, like everybody has to execute these extrinsics before you can even think about consensus for this block or move on to the next block. But this doesn't affect any of that, right? Yes, exactly. So, so this is pretty much where the where the limitation for blockchains come from, because whatever is in the block, whatever extrinsics are there, everyone in the network needs to run them to make sure that they have the same state. But there are many use cases where where this is like completely not desirable, and you want to run some some code, but not necessarily during the block import but somehow feed the results of that code execution back on chain. So in off-chain workers, we can do that from by, by sending transactions, for instance, that I guess we will go into more details later. Yeah, so like this is going to get some like input parameters from the runtime when it's called, and then it's going to go execute something, and it can come back five or 10 blocks later and submit the result as a transaction. Right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So right. what happens is, like, how, how, do, you, how do you actually uh, run, write this logic on chain. So let me jump to, um, we have this module called example, this palette called example. It's part of the frame in the substrate repo. Mm, and inside um, declare module macro. So the, the basic thing that where you put your logic, all, your, all, all the external functions that people can call in your module, um, you can also put something that is called, yeah, we have on initialize and on finalize callbacks here as well, but there is a, an optional callback that you can put in, and it's called off-chain worker, and that's where the off-chain worker logic will live. And yeah, um, again, I want to underline that this is, this is not going to be invoked during block execution, but separately kind of in parallel uh, to to regular block execution. Yeah, so like when you write your own palette, you can just add this function off chain worker, and then you can put any set of logic that you want, and this is going to get executed at every block. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So there are CLI, CLI flags to control who is running off chain workers, and by default, uh, if you are a validator in your network, off chain workers will be invoked. If you are not a validator, you will not run off chain workers. Uh, you can opt in to run them by uh, like flipping that flag. Yeah, and um, yeah, let me just show a quick example how to do a hello world here. So we have um, a module called fl frame support. Uh, from this module, I believe you can import debug, and then we can do print. from off-chain worker, and then we can display the current block number. Oop. And it's gonna be N, yep. So if we compile this, uh, if we deploy the network, then all the validators will start, start printing this line after every block. Just in there, like console? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, yeah, this, this, is, this is a print, so yeah, uh, yeah. it's gonna be just, uh, between other locks that the, yeah. the node is printing. Okay, so like, can we look at like the uh, the client or primitives and talk about like the interface that this provides? Mm -hmm. So here I, I used um, frame support, 
And um, this is where we have a couple of utilities that um, make it easy to use functions that are exposed for off-chain workers. But uh, firstly, since off-chain workers are just part of the runtime, um, you can pretty much access whatever you can access from your other runtime functions. So if you have any storage in your module, let me just jump to declare storage um, here. So we have, for instance, a dummy, um, uh, dummy balance, whatever that is. Uh, so we can easily access that from our off-chain worker uh, the same way we would access it from, from on finalized, let's say. So I can, oh, I can take this and put it over here. <clears throat> the thing is that that method is actually trying to modify the storage and this will, um, this will run correctly, but it will not trigger any changes in the state. Since the off-chain workers are run um, aside from the from the block imports, they can't modify the storage. The, they can't modify the state. They can read the state that is uh, that was there in a blockchain after a particular block was executed, but they can't easily alter anything. So will it only read the state from the block number it was triggered on, or will it read the state later? Uh, it can only read the, the current state. So if you are at block, let's say five, you can read the state after block five got imported on chain. But let's say this off chain worker takes five blocks of execution time. Mm -hmm. um, is it going to be reading the state only at block five or will it read the state at like block eight? No, it, it, it's, it's kind of pinned to this block okay. five uh, state. Yeah, so, so you don't have to worry has... about something changing like underneath yeah. it. Exactly. So what may happen is that you may have um, two off chain workers running in parallel. So let's say you import uh, block number five, then you import block number six, and those two off-chain workers would actually run at the same time. And there are ways for them to communicate uh, through uh, a special storage that I will go into details a little bit earlier, a little later. And um, and yeah, you also you sometimes have to take this under consideration that you may have multiple off-chain workers running at the same time. So maybe you need to acquire some lock so that you know that there is only one often worker doing this heavy stuff that you are about to do. Yeah, like a uh, fragment or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if you have something that takes, for for instance, like five blocks to compute, then it doesn't make sense to do on every block. It right. rather makes sense to do every five blocks. Yeah. So can we look at some example of where this is actually used within frame? Mm -hmm. uh, so the first module that was using often workers is uh, I'm online. Um, let me jump quickly here. And let me jump to off-chain worker logic. <coughs> so yeah, um, this stuff is actually using some of the special APIs that are avail available for off-chain workers, but are not available for um, regular runtime code. Um, so I mentioned earlier that you can try to modify the storage from the off-chain worker but it will not work. What I mean by this, it, it will not panic, so it's allowed. It will just, the change will not be persisted. Um, this stuff is a little bit different. So uh, everything that is inside this off-chain module in SPIO, which is this like low level interface between the, the sandboxed runtime environment and the host, the entire client, um, whatever you try to call from the off-chain, a module and you are not in the off-chain worker context, which means that you are, for instance, importing a block, uh, it will panic. So it's not allowed to, to call those functions in the runtime, but it's allowed to call them in the off-chain worker part. The reason for this is that um, a lot of those functions are just like non-deterministic and we don't want our state transition function to be non-deterministic, right. obviously. <laughs> um, yeah, so this thing is, is checking if the, if the current node is a validator and only then is triggering some additional logic. So let me quickly jump to SPIO to show you um, what other APIs we have available there. Mm, off chain. Oh. I think it should be, there should be a trait. Oh, yeah, here. So there is a trait called off-chain uh, in um, SP, SPIO. Uh, this primitives. Like, yes. 
Uh, you can also look it up in the in the docs, I guess. It might be more uh, easy to read what the actual API is. But there is a set of function here that you can actually invoke from the off-chain workers. Yeah, and just like a really quick refresher on primitives, like this is sitting between the runtime and the client. Um, mm -hmm. And like, can you just give like a quick overview of this primitives section? Um, yeah, so, so as you said, we have the runtime that is running in its own sandbox. And then, for instance, we want this runtime to be able to, I don't know, read from the state or write to the state. So everything, every function like this is going to be declared in this SPIO uh, thing. Usually, um, you don't use those functions directly because they are like super low level. So they have uh, raw access to the, to the state database. Uh, we have this nice wrappers for the runtime stuff uh, called declare storage, as you've seen. Uh, for off-chain stuff, uh, some of those functions are um, are have high-level wrappers. Uh, so, for instance, um, we have something that is called HTTP request start. So, there is a bunch of functions here that uh, allow you to make HTTP requests from off-chain workers. But actually, it's more recommended to use the high-level wrappers that make it easy to to do so. Yeah. Okay. Does does that answer your question? Or? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, and the, and this SPIO is that the primitives is what sits between the runtime, which is the sandbox environment that has to be super deterministic, and uh, and the host, so the node that uh, is actually executing this this runtime. Yeah, so like the host is going to have a database with all like these storage items, and you need to have an interface for how you kind of talk to the host and access these storage items. So like primitives is just like a set of traits to to provide the interface, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because because the runtime is running in WebAssembly in, in like the most generic case. Yeah. So you don't even know if you're running on Windows machine, Mac machine, it doesn't matter because the, the WASM is just executed by the WASM interpreter, but uh, um, the underlying database is actually tied pretty closely to the to the operating system or to the architecture that you're using. So you need this kind of like boundary between Runtime and the and the host. Yeah. So let's get back to the off chain worker part. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Like, what are some more examples? Or like, you were going to talk about this HTTP mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. So HTTP is uh, one of this um, nice, very non deterministic <laughs> uh, things that you that off chain workers can do and uh, the runtime can do. Um, so yeah, you can basically make an HTTP request. Maybe. I will jump to this um, high-level uh, wrapper because I think it's going to be uh, more easy to understand what the code is doing. Um, so I think it's off-chain RS inside primitives runtime. Yep. Okay, we have two not here, so let's go to um, HTTP. Okay, and we have an example that is not colored, but maybe let me jump to the test code. Very bottom, yes. This is where we have uh, an actual request being made. So this this stuff at the beginning is just like um, uh, setup of the of the test uh, environment. But this thing is something that you can write in your off chain worker code in your in your palette. Uh, so if you import this request object, you can do request get and pass a URL, and then um, to this request object you can append some headers, and finally send that request. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so, uh, when you send this request, this is this is an as asynchronous operation that is happening under the hood. So the host is actually sending that request, but you don't really know how long it's going to take. Uh, since the runtime and the WASM execution environment that we have is is inherently single threaded, um, we didn't want it to have. Uh, we didn't want to wait for that request to finish before you can do anything else. So the API is built around making this asynchronous request. And if you want to actually wait for that request to finish, you need to call a wait function on the pending uh, request. Um, there is also a way to, to wait with deadlines because this, will, th this function will wait independently. So it means that it can block your off-chain worker execution for a, for a long time. But if you want to like wait 200 milliseconds and then figure out, okay, I, I I'm not interested in the in the response anymore, uh, then there is an API that allows you to do that as well. Yeah. So, 
Um, once you get to your response, this is obviously very non non deterministic. Um, but then we also have some like deterministic things like running fragment. Um, mm -hmm. So this off chain worker is going to come back and it's going to submit a transaction. Um, and so like I'm sure we can do a video on different types of extrinsics, but we have you know inherence, unsigned transactions, and signed transactions. Exactly. So like when you use an off chain worker, what are, what kind of things do you have to consider about this response? And then like how do you handle each case? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so when you get a response, it's it's usually going to be JSON. So sometimes you need to parse that uh, that JSON. But yeah, uh, overall, at the at the very end, what often worker can do is if you want to uh, modify the the on chain data with your off chain computation, the only way to actually achieve that is to send one of those transactions. So you can't really send inherents because inherents are uh, are things that uh, validators produce. They um, they can do like non-deterministic stuff when they are being produced, but inherents are very tightly coupled to modules and and to validators. So there is no way for off-chain workers uh, currently to kind of um, insert or inject an inherent, an additional inherent into into the block. So the only pretty much things that we still have is the the signed transactions and unsigned transactions. If you go to if we go back to this. Um, SPIO um, interface, um, the only thing that we actually have here is just submit transaction. So the the low level API doesn't really care what the transaction is. Is it is it signed? Is it unsigned? Uh, it doesn't even know the format of the transaction. Um, so the way we actually produce a transaction, either signed or unsigned, is through adding this submit transaction uh, associated type to your module, to the, to the traits that defines your module. Um, so there is this additional bound that you can put here called submit unsigned transaction or submit signed transaction. And this, um, when you're creating your runtime, you have to pass a proper object there. And this will allow you to do something like this, uh, where you can actually submit a call to uh, to a particular method. Now, um, this call can either be signed and, or, or unsigned, as we said. This this one is actually submitting an unsigned transaction, unsigned call. So if we go um, to the prepare, I know, sorry, it's a heartbeat, I think. Mm, this one here. Um, so this is our public interface for the I'm online module. It has a heartbeat function that we are actually calling from the off-chain worker. And you can see that the first thing that we do here is ensure none. So it means that this is an unsigned uh, transaction. Um, however, uh, the payload that is inside this unsigned transaction is still signed and still has some things that we need to verify because uh, we need to make sure, since everyone can send this unsigned transactions, we need a way to, to ensure that uh, first, it's not a DOS vector, so so someone can produce you know um, multiple uh, unsigned transactions and have them all included in chain. Uh, so we need to de deduplicate them somehow, and we need to ensure that they are uh, they are valid. And the way we do it for unsigned transaction um, unsigned transaction is through a validate unsigned trait that is defined over here. Um, so for our module, this is I'm online example, we implement this validate unsigned trait, um, which allows you to check um, a call to that module and check if it's if it's valid. And this is executed uh, by the transaction pool. Um, when we see a transaction, we see it's an unsigned transaction and we want to check, is, is it still valid? Or is it is it a transaction that we have already seen in the past? Or um, should it is is it valid to include it in the in the in the next block? Yeah. So we'll do another video on the transaction pool. Um, so let's just talk like a few scenarios of when when you would use like an unsigned versus signed transaction from an off-chain worker. So like the heartbeat or like an HTTP request. This is pretty clearly unsigned because it's you you're not really proving anything, right? Like you can't prove that a website gave this response or something. Um, like when would you ever submit a signed transaction from a, from an off-chain worker? Mm -hmm. So um, submitting, like receiving unsigned transaction is actually much harder than signed transaction because if you, 
if you um, if you don't carefully write this validate unsigned function, you can open up your blockchain for like a DOS vector or um, like m mainly a computational DOS, or you can just include many transactions in a. And, uh, in, in subsequent blocks because unsigned transactions don't have nonce. So they don't have this like dead application built in. So we, the same transaction, for instance, can be valid multiple times. Yeah, so you need to have some like custom logic for each type of unsigned transaction. Exactly. And then signed transactions are easier because you need to pay for execution. So they, they use the regular model so if you are doing a transfer on a blockchain, like a you know an example substrate blockchain, because you can customize it as well, uh, you have to pay for that transfer. So there are some fees that someone has to pay. Which uh, in if you are sending a signed transaction, we know who sent that, we know who is going going to pay the fees. The nonce uh, thing is there, so there is the deduplication and replay protection built in. Uh, but the drawback is that you actually need to have some funds on the account that is sending those transactions. So for instance, in that particular case, in I'm online, um, those I'm online heartbeats are being sent by validators. So validators have a bunch of keys, but the keys that they are using for consensus, for instance, don't uh, have much balance because they are rotated frequently. We just need the uh, signatures. And this is why we chose to send an unsigned transaction here because we don't have to pay the fees, but still, the payload of that transaction is being signed by this uh, by this consensus key, and this is something that we verify um, at some point here. Let me just quickly find it. Yeah, signature valid here. So we take the entire heartbeat and we make sure that it's coming from one from one of those uh, one of the authorities. In yeah, the set. and then like this stuff is kind of inherent to the chain because it's like all the validators' keys and stuff. But like another example would be like a price fetch off-chain worker. So mm -hmm. you could say, everybody go like find the price of some token. And then the validation logic would actually say like, does my off-chain worker find the same price within, you know, like 1% because you're going to like, if everybody requests this API at different times or this HTTP request, they might get slightly different results if they're a few seconds apart. So you're not going to have actual agreements, mm -hmm. but you have to write this custom logic for every like unsigned transaction that you're doing. Yeah, exactly. and. Um... There are many ways to how you can build uh, an oracle, and this is not an easy task, I would say. Yeah. And this is one one of the options that you kind of let people in if they are close to the um, to the uh, kind of average or the overall result that other people are um, are sending. So like the shelling point of the of the correct price. Uh, yeah, but I mean, I would take. I, I would be very careful in uh, implementing an oracle using unsigned transaction because what, what you are saying is actually correct, but I, I can see a bunch of uh, you know other attacks that you could use. Uh, to, All right. <laughs> to do that, yeah. So use them, but be careful. Yes, exactly. <laughs> All right, we're going to close this one up. Thanks, Tomek. Thank you.